ever heard of Lynconia? I suppose that's how you would pronounce it, because it would be in juxtaposition with the name Lincoln. Lincolnia was the name of a proposed Central American colony suggested by Republican United States Senator Samuel Pomeroy of Kansas in 1862 after U.S. President Abraham Lincoln asked the Senator and United States Secretary of the Interior Caleb Smith to work on a plan to resettle freed African Americans from the United States. Let's begin by noticing the inscribed words over the statue of Abraham Lincoln in this temple. Clearly, this alerts us to the fact that the Abraham Lincoln Memorial is a religious temple specifically designed unto and for God. God. Abraham Lincoln has been hailed as one of America's greatest presidents and the worshiping of Mr. Lincoln is revealed in the undeniable memorializing of him. The first fact to note is that Abraham Lincoln's statue is perched inside the exact resemblance of an ancient Greek temple. This image of the Greek temple Parthenon on the Acropolis of Athens, Greece, dedicated to the Greek goddess Athena. The Lincoln Memorial is an exact resemblance to the ancient Athenian Greek temple. Roman and Greek temples were made for one purpose only, to provide shelter for the statue of the gods. It was believed that in the statues dwelt the spirits of the gods. The Greeks believed these temples preserved the majesty of the gods. The temples were dedicated to the gods and used to house the cult of that god. The creator of the Lincoln Memorial is Mr. Henry Bacon, who studied extensively in Europe, learning and adopting Roman and Greek structures. He brought his skill and learned knowledge of Greco-Roman design to America and designed an idolatrous pagan temple which symbolizes the idolatry of which America embraced. Everything about the Lincoln Memorial is 100% pagan, idolatrous, and a reproach to the name of the Most High. Since his early political career, Abraham Lincoln had supported the American Colonization Society, a controversial group whose goal was the removal of free blacks from the United States. It and its state affiliates, starting in the 1820s, began settlements in West Africa that would eventually unite to form Liberia. Similarly to Lincolnia, the name of Liberia's capital, Monrovia, was derived from the name of the fifth president of the United States. 
James Monroe. Lincoln desired to return former slaves to Africa or other tropical regions with their consent and the accord of the authorities of the country where they were to be settled. He repeated his support for colonization numerous times, including during the American Civil War. This is Fort Monroe in 1862. The 16th POTUS made its first attempt to ship freed African Americans back to Africa. It was a botched plan, but he made his first attempt. I'm standing right now at the, uh, I guess you would call it the uh, pedestrian boardwalk at Fort Monroe. This is the place, the location where the ship sailed out of Fort Monroe, which is in Hampton, Virginia, in 1862. September of 1862, 16th POTUS, President Abraham Lincoln, signed the Emancipation Proclamation which declared blacks free and it was presented to the world in January of 1863. But in 1862, President Abraham Lincoln had in his mind to get rid of those Africans off the American continent and send them back to Africa because he was the great colonizer. Let's walk down here a little bit and read this state placard. The state placard here, one of several state placards here in Fort Monroe. And here is a placard that says first Africans in Virginia. The first documented Africans in Virginia arrived here in August 1619 on the White Lion, an English privateer based in the Netherlands. Colonel Colonial officials traded food for these 20 and odd Africans who had been captured from a Portuguese slave ship. Among present day Hampton's earliest African residents were Antonio and Isabel. Their son, William, was the first child of African ancestry known to have been born in Virginia, circa 1624. Many of the earliest Africans were held as slaves, but some individuals became free. A legal framework for hereditary lifelong slavery in Virginia evolved during the 1600s. The United States abolished slavery in, 16, in 1865. Well, not really, they didn't abolish it. That was all on paper. A very good thing, and I'm gone. This is black history like you've never heard before.
There is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races from living together on terms of social and political equality. He said in 1858 in one of the famous debates with Stephen Douglas as he unsuccessfully vied for a U.S. Senate seat. And in as much as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be a position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having a superior position assigned to the white race. And yet Lincoln professed a belief that black people should have the right to live in peace and enjoy the fruits of their own labor. He also foresaw white mob violence in the event black people were freed. This raised a practical question if slavery is unjust and freedom is untenable, what should the United States do with all of its black people? He despaired of the prospect of peaceful racial coexistence, particularly if the emancipation of African Americans came about, Page said. In his quandary, Lincoln was in good company. Many members of the American Colonization Society, founded in 1816, shared his beliefs, claiming that immigration was in the best interest of black people. By 1862, Lincoln had decided that the Chiriqui province, at the time part of the Grenadian Confederation, but today in Panama, would be an ideal location to start a colony where blacks, especially freed men, could lead better lives than they could in the United States. In August of that year, he invited a group of prominent Africans to the White House to discuss the plan. He stated that the area had evidence of very rich coal mines and among the finest harbors in the world. African Americans, including Frederick Douglass, were in general firmly opposed to immigration and the delegation unsurprisingly reacted negatively. Later that month, the National Republican published an editorial with the title The Colony of Lincolnia, which stated that the necessary arrangements for founding a colony on a grand scale had been completed, with the project being headed by Senator Pomeroy. Pomeroy proposed that 100 African families travel with him to the site as pioneers on October 1. In September, Pomeroy received the permission of the Chiriqui government and landowner Ambrose W. Thompson of the Chiriqui Improvement Company. However, the Central American nations of Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Honduras felt threatened and informed Washington that they opposed this plan. Costa Rica had territorial claims in Chiriqui and made a formal complaint the representatives of Central America also considered Pomeroy's plan to be an example of filibustering. United States Secretary of State William H. Seward informed these nations that no plan would continue without their consent. But Lincoln continued to push the plan forward. By late September, after being advised by Seward of the growing international outrage from the Central American nation, Lincoln decided to pause his pursuit of the idea angering Pomeroy, who had already found 500 pioneers. Africans who were brought here against their will were actually people who were born free. They, of course, spoke several languages. And these were folks from the Ndongo Kingdom, a very powerful kingdom. So you had sort of to the north the kingdom of the Congo and to the south the kingdom of Ndongo. And those were the people who were attacked, those were the people who were enslaved, those were the people who, who eventually were brought to the Virginia colony. Consider the way we've been taught history 
for hundreds of years. The narratives, the records, the statues, museums, the textbooks, drowning out the African voices that complete the American story. As recorded by early English settler in the Virginia colony, John Rolfe, in late August 1619, 20 and odd Negroes arrived on the English ship, the White Lion, to Point Comfort, present day Hampton, Virginia. The first Africans to English North America, 12 years after Englishmen settled in Jamestown. Point Comfort was that first point of contact. It's a piece of land that jutted out just as you were getting to that body of water called the Hampton Roads. It had been a long and dangerous journey from their homeland, Angola. In Dongo, this is the precise location where most of those Africans would come from. Having their families, raising their families, they had their religions, they worship like people, you know, in their religions. Just doing what people do, running their businesses. Until the Portuguese settlers began to muscle away the African territory. Part of the reason they came there is because of the large presence of gold. And the Dongo in particular uh, mined a lot of gold and they uh, were very involved with the gold trade. And so the Portuguese were drawn to that area for that reason. The Dongo did not want to see the Portuguese expanding. So from 1618 to 1620, Portugal and Ndongo were fighting major wars. About 50,000 Africans were captured. 1619 was part of that group. The Spanish and Portuguese were also looking for more laborers for plantations back home in a slave trade that had been going on for more than 100 years. They actually raided the kingdom of, of Nadongo. They raided their capital and they took so many prisoners of war that reportedly there were 36 ships filled with people, at least 300 to 350 people per ship and they were shipping them out to their colonies. This is the port city of Luanda from where they were exported. One of those ships was the San Juan Bautista on its way to Mexico when it caught the interest of British pirates commanding a ship called the White Lion near Veracruz. And their primary goal was to attack mostly the Spanish ships or any Portuguese ships. So they went to attack this ship in consort with the treasurer, which was partially owned by the Virginia Company officials. And it's those two ships that attacked the San Juan Bautista that originally had 350 Africans aboard, but a good, almost half of them died during the voyage. And they attacked the ship and took 60 captives off of that ship and then made their way to Virginia. And somewhere along the way, the White Lion was about three or four days ahead of the treasurer. And the White Lion, when it arrived in Virginia, um, it, it stopped at Point Comfort and there were supplies exchanged for the captives. 20 or so of the 60 captives were on the White Lion, the rest on board the treasurer. What was so significant about Point Comfort? Point Comfort was the defense outpost for the Jamestown settlement. Protecting it from the Spanish. That's a model of the White Lion. Word spread to Jamestown that there was this, this new arrival and that the governor uh, should come and have a look-see. So for the most part, we saw the Africans treated as enslaved people. And the reason I say that is in the, the first 20 people who arrived, there's not a single name recorded. They don't even identify these people by their ethnicity. They identify them by a color. But two names listed as Negroes in the 1623-24 muster, Anthony and Isabella, living in Captain William Tucker's household. They're believed to have arrived as two of the 20 and odd on the White Lion. The 1624-25 muster shows Anthony and Isabel had a child, William, 
who was baptized. He's known as the first African born in English North America. On a mid-April day in 1863, hundreds of African Americans, hoping for better lives, boarded the Ocean Ranger at Fort Monroe in Virginia. The ship sailed away from a nation in the deep throes of the Civil War, bound for Illidbach, a small island of about 20 square miles off the southwestern coast of Haiti. Bernard Koch, an entrepreneur and Florida cotton planter, had promised the roughly 450 newly freed black immigrants on board that in exchange for working on a cotton plantation, they would receive homes, health care, schooling, and at the end of their four-year contract, 16 acres of land and back wages. Yet by the end of the voyage that May, about two dozen black passengers had died of smallpox. Those who landed found their lives worse than the ones they had left. Instead of the promised homes, they were made to sleep on dirt in small huts fashioned from palmetto and brush. Coke was despotic in his work demands. Hunger grew rampant. Malnutrition took root. Plans for a revolt took shape. A U.S. government official visiting the island found the settlers with tears, misery, and sorrow pictured in every countenance. The disastrous mission envisioned as the first installment of a grand colonization scheme that would settle 5,000 black people on the island, had a singularly powerful backer, Abraham Lincoln, the great colonizer, colonizer, colonizer. Where is our turn? The clergy's mad that we'll wait. we'll wait. How long you thought we gonna sleep? Huh. I'm just curious the reason I ask. Y'all ain't heard about the lost sheep. You be? See the word of God, we gon' eat. Pretty good. So dry bones rise to your feet. Get up. We the bride and it's time to clean up. Cause pretty soon the groom we gon' meet. Wonder it way. ain't deep, man, it's really kinda easy. easy. Wanna walk with the Lord like Jesus. Easy. Well, admit you been needing them lies. That's true. You ain't notice that it tastes kinda greasy. Yeah. Best pork chop, low down, sleazy. Oink. All I care about is the green. Motivate, motivate, motivate. Before you leave, better drop that cream. cream. Every Sunday, the same old thing. Knew it had to be something better than this Yeah, we all tired looking for a change Question is, do you want to take that risk? Checking off my list just one by one So many gonna fall away Take note of the scriptures The end of the world There's a hell of a price to pay Used to be from moving Judah Ashes and beyond It's the awakening You could be from 